Barney, let me turn it over to you and see what questions you want to tee up for us. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a, a couple. There's obviously just too many. I mean, I, I guess I wish we all had the capacity to go another hour. But um, one, if I, just a general question. If I think about DEPA as a, a, a little zoo, you, you've got different animals in that zoo. You've got the IRP, you've got the conservation and loads management plan, you've got the comprehensive energy strategy. Um, do they, how do they relate or do they relate? I know the IRP is a feeder or it seems like it's a feeder into the comprehensive energy plan, but, and I'm yeah. asking that question. So we sort of know how to, how we, the, um, the advocacy and uh, task force community know how to get involved. Sort of, if we know the flow of events and what influences things downstream. It's a really good question. So uh, thanks for that. I think um, we have a variety of planning processes, right? Our, our two biggest, uh, uh, internal to be ETP planning processes, although you know uh, they they both uh, involve a lot of stakeholder engagement, are the integrated resources plan, which is really focused on um, electric supply, and then the comprehensive energy strategy is a much more broad look, generally at our energy use um, across sectors. So um, we see a need, so we, we're just wrapping up the integrated resources plan. It got rebooted by executive order three, um, Governor Lamont's executive order three, uh, very proud that uh, executive order one and executive order three were both aimed at energy and, and climate initiatives. Um, so the IRP, you know, because it got rebooted by that executive order is, uh, you know, came out behind the original schedule. And so now we're getting ready to start the CES so since we've done the electric sector uh, portion in the IRP, the CES will be focused uh, on the building sector. And we've also done the electric vehicle roadmap uh, that came out last year. So, you know, so those things, you know, are sort of incorporated um, into the comprehensive energy strategy. And we'll be focusing, we see a significant need to focus on the thermal sector at this stage. That's and, and we also, I also saw the part of the question that referred to the GC3 and, um, you know, obviously the stakeholder process uh, uh, involved with the GC3 is so intensive and there's so much good work done there. Um, and, you know, so certainly the work that's done with the GC3, as soon as that, you know, was completed, that's been rolling out not just through, um, it, it won't just come into our CES, it will be incorporated, uh, the recommendations will be incorporated and studied in our, in our comprehensive energy strategy, but will also be um, incorporated and considered as we uh, roll through with the three-year plan for the conservation and load management plan. And we also actually addressed some of the issues uh, in the 2021 plan update for the conservation and load management plan. So, um, you know, I think it all feeds together in a way uh, that uh, seems complicated, but we, we try to do it really in sort of in real time as much as possible. That, that's, that's, that's really helpful. And it's, it kind of leads into the next question, which we, Julia Domain, you should you should know that there's a there's a substantial number of us on this call who would light a scented candle and begin reading the IRP. Uh, we've paid a lot of attention to that. As if you think your efforts have been in vain, that they weren't. A lot of people paid a lot of attention to that. One thing that stands out in the IRP is that the definition of success is procuring, which is to say buying the, the, the power. And that is embodied in Senate Bill 882, which is one of the governor's bills and um, which we're supportive of those goals, but sort of from our perspective of looking into the future and saying, but there's all these natural gas plants. And in fact, the IRP made a point that in Connecticut uniquely in New England, the number of natural gas plants has increased even as we became a net exporter of, of energy sometime around 2013. So how do we think about that? And this, I know this is a giant question. Do yep, we... um, I'll take that one. So, um, you know, we hear, we definitely hear the concern here. Um, we hear the concern about the siting of new gas plants. We're also extremely concerned about where uh, fossil fuel plants are, are, are currently located, especially some of our oldest and, and dirtiest fossil fuel plants. This is an issue that we've been focused on 
resolving um, across the board because that's a significant environmental justice issue, right? Um, we don't want to be the place where, uh, you know, it, it, on the New England grid where, where these things are cited, but we also have to be aware that this is a regional grid. And um, so our approach of uh, focusing on regional market reform, where we actually think, we think it's viable and, you know, that we can, we can make progress, especially with, you know, FERC is indicating an interest in this now. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing an interest from FERC and from the Biden administration in this issue. Um, you know, the climate change is not just a Connecticut issue. It's a regional issue. It, not a, it's a worldwide issue, but we have a regional grid. And so we're very focused on coming up with solutions that take care of this problem holistically across the board and including existing resources that are already uh, causing substantial air pollution problems in um, our environmental justice communities. And, um, you know, I think there are, there's a lot of promise that, that we'll be able uh, to uh, make progress on that um, regionally and federally. And sort of in, in response to, to that, um, first of all, we, one of the main polls or one of the main groups on the call today is the is the energy task forces and we're all about trying to be make things happen on the ground and also participating in the regulatory process in a in a thoughtful way and, yep. and so that's in fact why we're so delighted that you all came today uh, a suggestion was way made way back in the, in the chat this this siting issue is so complicated because there's so many players. There's ISO New England. There's the federal government and, and FERC sort of over over that. There's um, the siting council. There's DEEP. There's Pura. There's different forms of representation and limited representation in some of those jurisdictions. Is it possible? And I think some of us on this call would certainly work on this to look at this as a, as a process. So say, pretend I'm a fossil fuel uh, plant manufacturer and I come and I wanna site a, a plant. Where, do, where does it start? Like where, wh what's the first point of entry? What are, what are all the points of influence along the way? And so we end up with a flow chart so that we in the advocacy community, we as residents of our state, know how we can best direct our efforts and, and get ahead of the process in a, in a useful and meaningful way. Because often by the time they make it to us, they're a fait accompli. I, I certainly, I, I don't wanna be defeatist, but that's how I feel about Killingly. And I, I, I don't know enough about NRG and Middletown, but I, I, I feel like it's far down the pike also. Yep. Is that, that something we could work on? I saw that request in the chat. That's certainly something um, you know we'd be happy to take a look at and, and try to um, you know put together for people. Um, I would also you know I'm also very excited that uh, we have our, you know people from our town energy committees on this call. Um, the more people that we can get sort of joining in on our regional approach and and um, demonstrating an interest there. Um, and we have a website that maybe somebody could enter into the chat. I think it's new at England energy visions.com, something like that. Uh, but I'll, we'll enter it into the chat where people can see what the process is for filing comments. Um, you know, we would really appreciate, uh, people to come together and come into that proceeding and, and, um, you know, provide input into that regional proceeding as well. I also want to highlight for our town energy uh, committees and and also for community organizations um, that are locally based that that we are um, looking at uh, we are going to uh, begin a process to do an RFP within the um, conservation and load management program because we really do see the need and the benefit to engage with our our municipalities and local community groups and I know Mike touched on this a little bit. Um, I think the combination of, of that and adding a municipal representative to the Energy Efficiency Board will really help us um, to, uh, to, to focus our program in a way that uh, uh, gives communities the, the ability to give direct input into, into you know, what would be beneficial within their community. So uh, very excited about that opportunity. Yeah, 
and I, I do see the the reference. Everybody should New England Energy Vision dot com is is posted in the chat. Thank you. Thank Julie. you. Um, a, a very specific question, uh, Julie. I uh, alluded to it. it. I know. I know it comes from Duncan Broach, who who leads Summit Hydro. Actually, runs a, a hydro plant. I know, and I've seen him speak in a, a, I think in Basra, perhaps. Uh, I, I don't think this is a giant resource, but it seems like actually just going back to our New England roots. We, we New England is New England because we had hydropower, and it was enough to power those old will. Is there is there a way I'm thinking in the IRP sourcing electric electricity or in a conservation and load management plan um, to to highlight and better compensate? Uh, I guess maybe how do we start that process is the question. Yeah, I think that's another, you know, it's a good plan and it's another process that really needs. This is, you know, where uh, having energy environment together uh, is really beneficial because um, we can coordinate with our environmental quality branch and our environmental conservation branch who also have a role to play obviously in hydro, right? Um, so I think, you know, uh, that's, I would be happy um, to meet with anyone who's interested in talking about that offline. I mean, there are uh, natural resource issues with respect to hydro, but we, you know, for existing hydro, you, you know, it's something, I think it's really a case by case situation, um, certainly, uh, there can be, you know, successful deployment of hydro as long as we're uh, protecting our natural resources. And in, in many cases, uh, there are things like fish ladders and and so forth that uh, can be helpful in that regard. Um, I think that's the type of thing that benefits from. Um, we have a concierge service uh, through our commissioner's planning office that um, that helps to bring together all the parts of the agency involved in uh, in in siting. And permitting issues, um, I think that you know that that's uh, probably a good place to start. But if um, you know if people want to reach out through our uh, energy bureau email, we can get them into the you know into the right process there. Very good, and I, I know we are running out of time, but um, two two questions uh, sort of keep coming up with with regard to, or two comments. Um, Training, training the workforce. And I think all of us at this point know that we just don't have, for what we need to, we don't have enough to do what we are doing now, let alone what we know we need to do in, in right. the future. Community colleges as, as a resource is has been mentioned a, a lot of times. And I'll just throw this other one in so you can think about it is, is the EEB, it'd be great to have a low income person as, as you said, but we'd also love somebody from the energy um, task force community. And it's possible we might get a twofer. If we get the right person, we might get, you know, uh, somebody that can uh, address both of those constituencies. But I know a lot of people on this uh, call would be interested in, you know, getting on that EEB. Absolutely. And people should feel free to reach out about that. And, and the other thing is, you know, people can come and, and come to the meetings and engage with the EEB and present proposals to the EEB without being members as well. And that's, you know, that's another, you know, way for people to engage in the process. So, but I hear you on the community college front. I also think we have to work more closely with our high schools because not every job uh, in uh, energy requires, uh, you know, a community college certificate. So I think, you know, we're, 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 we are looking closely at that and the Lamont administration is very focused on workforce development uh, across the board. So, um, you know, it's definitely on our agenda and we're happy to engage on that with anybody who's interested in talking about it. Okay. And we and at this point we have your web address so yes we get ready <laughs> yeah oh so, um and you know if you send uh questions into that address we can get them to the right people the right work the right work teams right yeah that was actually a, a point of comparison i think on the pura call they they had actually set up a, f a function to do that very thing uh it's sort of yeah. What's your question? And they would sort of direct the questioner to the right, the right resource, which is yeah. a huge service. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we know, I mean, it's hard for people to know how to approach us. And we want to break down some of those barriers. So very good. Um, I think at, at this point, um, I, well, there's I guess one one last tech there's a, a lot of technical questions. So there's 
and energy storage being one. Um, some of that, I know Pura has got a, moder a grid modernization uh, docket. That There's also a storage bill that uh, is pending uh, before um, uh, the Energy and Technology Committee currently that I think is similar to what is uh, going uh, on in the Pura grid mod docket on storage. We definitely, within the IRP, I mean, storage certainly has a significant role to play uh, as we bring inter more intermittent resources online, right? Uh, storage, energy efficiency, demand response are going all going to be extremely important to help balance out, how to reload, but also to balance out the grid and to provide resilience uh, for people and, uh, and for the grid. So um, very, very uh, uh, interested. It's, it's, you know, we do cover it in the IRP. It's going on um, within the pure docket and there's an opportunity to discuss it. With yeah, I would love to add up to that a little bit too. And I think the, I don't remember who the person was that submitted that first question when I was presenting about storage, but I apologize that I didn't reference it more. I, like um, Bernie stated, there's a lot to condense into that. <laughs> Well, I failed at condensing it into 25 minutes, but uh, storage was a critical resource that we looked at in the IRP too. Um, I didn't get into the actual modeling results of every single uh, or of the um, of the different scenarios, but particularly after Millstone um, retires in the scenarios where we tested that, I mean, storage does become an extremely critical resource in providing, um, like Deputy Commissioner Packett mentioned, resilience resources. Um, uh, capacity, uh, operating reserves, and lots of different resources like that. And we also um, include a recommendation towards the end that really starts to focus on how we can um, create more uh, mechanisms to advance storage in Connecticut um, and, and really starting to engage on that. And um, it's, it's becoming more rapidly, the costs are declining and are expected to over the next decade or so. So we are definitely looking at storage. Storage is going to be enormously important and there's a lot of different ways to do it, both in traditional, the battery energy storage um, sense, but then there's other opportunities that we are starting to look at to see how we can diversify that important resource as well. So uh, agreed with everything that Deputy Commissioner Hackett just said, the um, Pura docket is really a, a good place to start looking at how um, we're integrating that into our uh, modernized grid. But um, I, please don't interpret the fact that I wasn't able to talk directly about that in my presentation as the, the lack of importance for storage. <laughs> um, well, let, let me let me close now. And I actually saw a comment that somebody's head is about to explode and mine will probably be right, right, right after. I, I, I wanna personally thank all of our speakers Deputy Commissioner Hackett, Ju Julia, Michael, and Jamie. Um, it's been amazing. I, I also think it's a beginning and, and not an end. And is always the case, I, I wanna just turn it over to Patrice Gillespie, who is the convener of this, of this uh, CT Energy Network, has done a lot of the work of setting this, this up and always closes us off with a, with a good mission. So Patrice? Well, I hope so. Um, yes, I'm Patrice Gillespie. I'm, I'm the person that emailed many of you at one o'clock in the morning recently. Um, I'm a member of and a manager of the CT Energy Network. And um, it's clear to me that, um, and I'm sure everyone on this uh, in this info session agrees that we have the right um, map makers at DEEP uh, to show us the road forward to a, to a future with 100% clean renewable energy and, and better health for everyone. Thanks to all four of you uh, from the Bureau, really appreciate it. Um, we also have obviously a very energized and competent army of energy professionals and local volunteers who are keen on implementing the right policies and programs and technologies to get us there. Um, you know, energy efficiency is kind of where my heart lies. and. Many of you may know about the vision for Connecticut's 100% renewable energy future that was set out by a Stanford University professor, uh, Dr. Mark Jacobson. <clears throat> and he, he asserts that with existing technologies and aggressive demand management, uh, we could realize in Connecticut um, that kind of future, 100% renewable energy by 2050. His calculations 
um, encompass all sectors. So it, we're talking about electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, and industry, all powered by wind, water, and sunlight. Um, but any such goal cannot be reached unless we reduce demand by about 40%. So that re mostly requires the intensive weatherization of Connecticut's buildings to protect us from extreme heat and wintry conditions. Um, so let us all be energy efficiency advocates and convince our respective personal networks um, that energy efficiency in our, in our built environment is absolutely essential. We need to insulate everything, you know, as, as Houston people have recently learned, and, um, and we need to leverage energy wherever it exists. So case in point, um, when I installed my new hybrid air source heat pump, water heater, it's a water heater. So it's in my basement. Um, just doing that installation cut my home energy usage by that quintessential 40%. Just that. So um, I share that with whenever I can. Um, I put three um, links, three little notes um, in the chat about some upcoming events um, that address the built environment. Um, the, the Connecticut Green Building Council um, is responsible for two of them and the Sierra Club and the two co-hosts of this session um, are doing something on March 30th. I hope you can all join. Um, so I just wanted to say sincere appreciation to all of you who have attended today. Special thanks to Vicki and Mike and Julia and, and to um, Jamie and, um, and to my buddies, Mark and, and Bernie. Um, additional thanks to the software developers who created Zoom and to the utility companies that uh, delivered the power so this meeting could be made possible. Thank just you very quick, much, everybody. Yeah? Just a quick note, um, in case you didn't get every single word today, uh, <laughs> this has been recorded and it will be posted on the PACE website. Patrice will send out a link, as are all past events of this group. Yeah. Uh, we'll save the chat, excuse me, we'll save the chat and distribute that as well. So. Um, this will. Um, this was now. We. This was is a part of the, uh, of the whole, literature. And uh, so, thank you, thank you, Deep, for your this terrific candor and openness. And uh, as as Patrice said, um, this this is this. Let's continue this discussion. Right. Thank you so much for having us. I, I really can't thank you enough. It's been so valuable to talk with you all and hear from you all. And I look forward to continued engagement. And as Patrice said, uh, heat pump hot water heaters, we have great incentives in our conservation and load management plan right now for those. So um, get on board with that. Great. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Take care, everyone. <laughs>